Hello again, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and this little one-off show. It doesn't kind of fit in with the theme of the week, which is the Mediterranean War, but when the opportunity came up, I leapt at it because uh, With the Old Breed was one of those books that I suppose, not I suppose, it did set me on the route to what I do now. Uh, this is, I, I'm not sure this is the first copy I ever had. It's an original first edition. I lost a dust jacket years ago. You can tell by how brown and uh, the pages are. It's been well thumbed, well read. And I should probably buy a new one with a nice new cover. But that is the one I have. And I don't know whether I was 12 or 13 or so when I read it. I, I don't know how I heard about it. I have no idea. But it was one of those ones that set me on the, uh, the understanding that war isn't about aircraft types. It's not about which tank has the biggest gun. It's not about which uniform that person is wearing in this part of the war or that part of the war. It's about human experience and the suffering of humans in warfare and what it does to them, what it does to them at the time, what it does to them post-war and so, so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, well, I don't really need to introduce um, my guest. Henry Sledge, by will, is the son of Eugene Sledge, E.B. Sledge, the author of With the Old Breed. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce him. So good afternoon, Henry. How are you today? I'm good, Paul. How are you? I'm very well. It's the end of the week now, so I'm, I'm flagging a little bit, but uh, the weekend will revive me up. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, you've done quite a few of these podcasts and interviews and stuff like that, and we'll talk later on, I hope, about why you think it's important to carry on your father's legacy. But sure. the first thing I wanted to talk to you about is in my prep for this, even today, I googled Eugene Sledge, and up comes, it says Eugene Sledge, author, and that is how the automated Google system defines your father. Right. And I, I don't know that that is actually, from my point of view, an, an appropriate label for your father, because author to me implies someone making a career choice, someone whose who's writing is a passion, writing is something they, they want to do, they're creative, whereas I see your father is part of that category of someone who it's a cathartic experience of, of somehow trying to put his wartime experiences into order for himself and his own recovery. Is that fair to say? That's absolutely fair to say. I guess if you wanted to typecast it and say, you know, how would Eugene Sledge have described himself? The thing that comes to my mind would be scientist. Uh, you know, when he when he came home from World War II and began the healing process that, that so many uh, World War II veterans began when they made it home, the ones who did make it home, um, he came to say later that science was his salvation. And I don't mean that in any religious sense. I, mm. I mean that in his, his mental process of dealing with what we now call PTSD, science was his salvation. He absorbed himself in not just science, but, but all manner of things academic. Uh, he had a tremendous intellectual curiosity about things. He was an incredibly intelligent man. And and th that comes across. And, and, you know, one of the things you just said there about trying to deal with his experiences of the war, he was by no means unique in trying to process the horrors of World War II. And, and it's, it applies whether you're a Marine on a Pacific island or a, or a British commander in North Africa or a bomber pilot flying over Germany. They all had the same kind of experiences. What was rarer was mm -hmm. in the era that we're talking about, someone to actually attempt to try and put those thoughts into some kind of structure within their head to then move on with it. Because as you said there, PTSD hadn't been labeled. We've done, we've done shows about PTSD. We've talked about um, the, the gradual progression over the gen generations of talking about shell shock and combat fatigue and all these other words we've given it. It now has a label. Right. Um, so, so author is whatever, whatever reason is what your father is left with as a label. But yeah, as you said, a scientist would might be a more appropriate one. So we labeled the show, we titled the show, the man, the book and the legacy. And I know there's a lot of people watching this who are of a similar age group to m myself and you who grew sure. up with this as one of those seminal books. And, um, and, and he, obviously your father passed away a good 20 years ago now. So never Correct. saw the global reach of the Pacific TV show, the understanding that there would have been people who'd read his book around the world. But, and this is a trite question, but if he was here today in 2021, 
what would he think, do you think, about the fact people are dis discussing his work, his life over this medium of the internet and unable, you know, to, he's reached people who speak multiple languages over multiple places. What would he think of that? He would be humbled by it. Um, I can tell you anecdotally, I'll refer to this. In 1991, it was the, the 50th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. And my mother to this day tells this story. There were a lot of celebrations, a lot of recognitions, as you can well imagine, for such an iconic event. And as those things trickled away, my mom remembers that my father told her, well, that's it. You'll never hear any more about World War II. 50th anniversary, done, done and dusted. As they say in Britain, done and dusted. It's out of the way now. You'll never hear any more about it. People will stop caring about it. Um, he did not write with the old breed. And certainly, Paul, you know, I've talked enough that I know you get this. He didn't write that book to garner fame or attention no. for himself. You know, it was a cathartic process. And to, to also use this to answer your question, I think he would be edified by the fact that here in this day and age, you know, one of the things that grieved him, Paul, was the fact that he felt Peleliu was a forgotten battle. And he had so many good friends who either were, were grievously wounded or killed on Peleliu. And that grieved him no end until the, until the end of his life. And, you know, it, it, I, I saw a letter here after doing a, a show, not to, for somebody, a podcast, not that long ago, somebody sent in a facsimile of a letter. And in that letter, it was my dad writing to Stumpy Stanley and RV Bergen in 1980 when with the old breed was, written and and pretty much ready to be published it just hadn't dropped yet okay and in that letter it was so poignant because he said guys i spent the last i don't know how many years obsessing over the details the minutiae of things that we all wanted to forget when we came home hmm. i've had to live in those things because i, I felt driven to tell the story and I wanted to tell it right. And I wanted to tell it in a way that not only would provide a record for my family, but would do you guys, meaning his fellow K-35 veterans, uh, would do you guys proud. And in this letter, he said, I I'm done. I'm laying my pen down. This thing's about to be published. I'm ready to focus on, on my work, which was as a college professor, as a scientist, my family. And it's really ironic that he became, he, he, he had to deal with the consequences of his own success because I don't think he expected the book to get the traction that it got. Um, I think if he were sitting here today and you could say, well, 11 years ago, they did a $250 million miniseries with you as a central character or, you know, one of three main characters, I can see him just shaking his head and, and just being completely nonplussed by it. My, my dad was a very non-egotistical, non-egocentric individual. And, th and that comes across in the book and it come, you know, and it, I think there's, there's going to be some people who probably your father's book was one of only a handful of World War II books they read because it was one of those books that people would pass on. I think a modern parallel would be Unbroken. You know, that, right. that was a book that that war buffs maybe started reading it. And then they said to, to their friends, their work colleagues, their partners, you should read this. And I think With the Old Breed had that kind of reaction. But right. for those of us who have read a hell of a lot of World War II books, and I don't even know how many I've read, but it's going to be hundreds, probably into the low thousands. Is that there's an honesty and there's a there's a there's a visceral um, gut wrenching quality to a handful of books. Your father's is one of them. Donald Arbour, Get a Career Here, Screaming Eagle. Normandy is one of them. Uh, Sydney Jarry, a British guy, eighteen platoon. Um, for, there's a handful of books that have that real visceral honesty, but not because it, I felt like the author was trying to put that on the page for the for the reader. He was putting it on the page 
because that's how it was for his own experience. And he wanted to put it down for himself first. And I think that's right. why it's it has lasted the test of time because it he was ultimately writing for himself and for you, his family. And the exactly. fact it found an audience because of its raw, brutal honesty was was a was a was a bonus in a sense. Yeah, it was a byproduct, a, a fortunate byproduct, if you will. And, and for those, I mean, I can't believe there's anybody watching this who hasn't read it, but just. I mean, I wanted to read this. This is what Tom Hanks said at some point when The Pacific came out. Eugene Sledge became more than a legend with his memoir with the old breed. He became a chronicler, a historian, a storyteller who turns the extremes of the war in the Pacific, the terror, the camaraderie, the banal and the extraordinary into terms we mortals can grasp. That's what Tom Hanks said. Well, I put up a couple of, 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 of the quotes from the book here, and I had this one up on screen earlier. And this is, you know, your father talking about Peleliu. Something in me died at Peleliu. Perhaps it was the childish innocence that accepted as faith the claim that man is basically good. Possibly I lost faith that politicians in high places who do not have to endure war savagery will ever stop blundering and sending others to endure it. I mean, if you just pro take on board how much literary depth that that one paragraph has, I mean, it's extraordinary stuff. I know, I know when the, the published book came out, he was in kind of middle age at that point. But the, the basic writing, the notes had been taken when he was a teenager, essentially. Correct. But to, to convey that amount of raw honesty, as I say, I don't think it was, from my reader's point of view, it wasn't aimed at the reader. It, you know how you're reading a book and you know the author has been back and forth through the thesaurus to try and impress us, the reader, with his grasp of 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 language i don't as brilliant as your father was i think his mastery of language was all about him making it sense of it to himself does that, that make that, does that make sense to you i think that's very perceptive paul I, and and yeah i mean because again being as unegocentric as he was and you know not trying to impress anyone but just I guess let, let me use this as an example. You know, my, my brother's a little bit older than me. And when we were growing up and, you know, Paul, we're from the same time frame, you know, Battle of the Bulge and, and Tobruk and, and Patton and, you know, those iconic yeah. movies back yeah. in the 70s that we all watched. You know, my dad would walk through the room and and, <clears throat> and he would never watch them. And, and, you know, the way his mind worked, any true veteran, any true combat veteran, and I hope I don't offend anybody if I say this, but any true combat veteran who wanted to sit there and watch a war movie, to him, he, he's like, I, I, that's the last thing I want to watch in the first place because they can't convey it, the true sense of it. But, you know, he, he exactly, war is brutish and inglorious. I mean, you know, he, he might walk through and see a John Wayne movie. And, and you know, he didn't dislike John Wayne, but he would just kind of, chuckle and go yeah the duke's going to get them taken care of you know and or well they all look a little bit too clean and a little too well fed compared to how we all looked you know and he saw i think war films as something that touched on the vainglorious aspects of it and to him and, and he does it in beautifully horrific detail when he when he talks about filth and fear and you know just the fact that on Peleliu, I mean, after three days, you know, you and your foxhole buddy both stunk. Mm. There was no way to get yourself clean. I mean, to, to him, those, you know, some people might hear that and, 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 you know, people who don't <clears throat> consume a lot of World War II history like we do. And they might think, well, this guy's just trying to sensationalize something or have some shock value. And that wasn't it at all. It was just such a visceral horrific process to him and he felt like people didn't understand that and he felt like the war films of the day did not convey that yeah i mean and th this is one of the things i i always struggle with as a as i grow you know i grew up for those who know i'm 50 miles out of london you know mm -hmm. um i hadn't seen a mountain i'd seen the sea because we you're always near the sea in england but i hadn't right. seen the mountains i hadn't seen the pacific ocean i hadn't seen the pacific ocean to be fair um i always struggled as a teenager to, to get to i to understand volcanic islands like Iwo Jima. i know your father wasn't there or or right. um or jungles or coral reefs or clear waters where you could see fish or 
or, or being so hot that your clothes were rotting. Like that all couldn't make sense. I could kind of understand normally because it was the other side of the water for me and I'd been to see it. Sure. And I can understand the Battle of the Bulge because that was like me. But the Pacific was always an alien environment. And and I, I don't, I don't, as I said at the beginning of the show, I don't remember what age I was when I read your father's book, 12, 13, 14. But it was one of the ones that it made the Pacific come alive for me because he does talk about the the grime and the fit and the heat and the creepy crawlies and the, the humidity and the dirt. And in a weird way, I, I don't, I don't, I didn't want to talk about the Pacific TV show too much, but in some ways, as great as it was in portraying everything, my own imagination had filled in the horror of Peleliu weirdly better in some ways than the TV she ever did because because you could sense with the TV show there was a lot of money went into it and it was there was a even though it was trying to portray the griminess, it was portraying it in a glossy Hollywood way. If that isn't the kind of paradox, you could sense lots of money had been spent on it, which it was. And the book, my brain filled in the gaps in a in a in a more grimy way, if that makes any sense to people watching this, you know. So um mm-hmm. You know, and I, I, but going back to what you said about you, that your father defining himself as a scientist, and and and, mm-hmm. and let's, if you don't mind, let's talk a little bit about PTSD because sure. you know we've been able within this fifteen minutes of this conversation to label what it was your father was almost certainly suffering from. Although PTSD is not a single single condition, everybody's experience is slightly different. As a as a, a when you were growing up with your brother, how what did you think your father was experiencing? How, I mean, he was your father. Everything in your household would have been normal to you. And there's the Sid Phillips household, you know, in, in the same area. You know, but what what did you get any sense that your father was struggling? I, th- I think that <clears throat> my older brother definitely saw more of that than I did. Uh, but yeah, you know, there were there were things, um, and if I. I think a lot's been made of that, certainly in the Ken Burns series, The War. They touched on his his struggles after coming home, uh, and they did in the Pacific as well. And all of that's true, uh, but it's nothing that that everyone else escaped. Um, mm. But there were there were things I saw. You know, I, one story that I have shared with people is again to go back to an iconic war movie, Paul, that you'll remember, Patton. Okay. Hmm. My brother and I would have been five years old at that point. I think it was 1970. Uh, Somehow my brother talked to my dad. Hey, it's going to be a good movie. They say it's really well done. You need to watch it. Um, And he talked my dad into sitting there and beginning to watch it. And of course, I'm like five years old, six years old. And we're we're sitting in our living room, a little black and white TV watching Patton. The scene where all the tanks are, I think it's in Tobruk. And it is just this horrific artillery bombardment, one after the other, you know, one shell after the other. And tanks are just getting blown up left and right. And it's just this relentless cacophony of sound. And I can remember my dad sitting there and getting visibly agitated. And this is hard for me to share. I'm going to push through it without getting choked up because it is really hard to remember. He ended up going in the kitchen and just starting to pound the refrigerator. Wow. And... So my mother got him, you know, got him calmed down. And as I came to learn later, when they were under heavy artillery fire, they would pound the sides of their foxholes just out of sheer frustration and desperation. Um, That was probably the most, you know, probably the most vivid uh display that I ever saw. But I, I have to say this, and if there, there's anything I want people to understand about E.B. Sledge, he was a master of self-control. You know, I never felt like, nor did my brother, um, he internalized it. Okay. I never felt like, oh, dad's sitting over there looking really disturbed, better leave him alone. You know, we, he he would never inflict that upon his family. Yeah. And and he did a beautiful job of of dealing with it in in the best possible way. And that and that's absolutely worth mentioning, isn't it, Henry? Because I yes. think you know my my family, who I mean, my great uncle who was on Sword Beach was blown up by a grenade. You know, he lived a very normal life, really. I mean, sure. whatever demons he had, which he did have, um, and in his case, it was 
briefly talk about my own family when he in Normandy woke up the morning after a horrific battle when half his friends had been killed or wounded there was a sheep that had that had blown itself up or something on a mine and it was trying to eat grass but the bottom half of its face was missing mm-hmm. and that sheep's face would be the thing that would torment him when he had nightmares but he didn't have them every night it wasn't like he was dealing with with this on a on a day-to-day basis it would be something that would ed- would come back every now and then but I've, right. other than that he he married he raised a family he was you know he, he he had a good career and so on and so forth. So I think we can we can sometimes say that 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 we by labeling someone as PTSD, we're 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 somehow suggesting that they were unable to go on with their life. And self-control right. is something that that generation had had in spades, most of them. And that's not to say there aren't maybe people watching this whose family members did end up having real problems you know alcohol right. abuse or whatever or leaving a, but for the majority of them it was something they could manage just as they managed the the experiences of of dealing with Peleliu and okinawa as your I, father did it's, i think um, my, i think my dad would have given a lot of credit for that to my grandfather because he was a physician and he had dealt with what we now call ptsd back then they called it shell shock shell shock victims of world war one and when my dad came home, and they did portray this, I think, quite well in the miniseries, uh, but he he did a lot. I remember him talking to me about this when I was a kid. He did a lot of sitting around and just trying to figure out what am I going to do with my life and just being depressed, you know, and, and uh, just trying to emotionally heal. And my grandfather, because my mom remembers this quite well, even though they weren't married yet, my grandfather told him, look, you went through something very few people can imagine but you're lucky you have your eyes you have your legs you have your arms and you made it home you survived make something of yourself do not let yourself be consumed in self-pity read good books let your you know, feed your intellectual curiosity. Do not succumb to alcohol abuse. You know, it's okay to drink moderately, but don't let it be your master. Um, and and I think if my dad were sitting here today, he would give my grandfather a tremendous, my grandfather was a very perspicacious man. And I think my dad would give him a lot of credit for, for keeping him on track, you know? And then then as he got more involved in, in pursuing a scientific career, that took on critical mass. And I think, you know, certainly 1952, he married my mom. My brother came along in 1957. I came along in 1965. You know, um, when you think about all these things he went through, I, I just can't express enough the admiration I have for his ability to keep it so self-contained. Um, but, you know, it, it, I'll share one little anecdote with you kind of, kind of humorous but it is reflective of something more serious i i was probably 10 or 11 years old and you know paul you remember those little plastic guns you could get at the dime store and they had the little Mm -hmm. clapper in them when you pull the trigger and they you pull the trigger and it goes you know like that i had one of those and the the pantry in our kitchen in the house when i was growing up i thought it would be funny to hide in there and jump out at my dad when he walked by and he i knew he was coming down the hall he made a right turn to come in the kitchen and i pushed the door of the pantry open and i jumped out with that little tommy gun he spun around i will never forget the look on his face and i never did that again Mm. and he didn't do anything bad to me he didn't do anything he shouldn't have done i mean he i got a whipping for it but I, i probably deserved it you know yeah I mean, and these these are the things that that we can relate to. Although, in a, I can't relate to it because sure. you know, I, 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 I live in a world where World War Two is coursing through my veins seven days a week. Right. But I would never ever claim to know what it was like to be, you know, at Arnhem mm-hmm. Bridge when you know there's no reinforcements coming, or on Peleliu when you're dealing with your friends being killed around you by just an enemy that you can't even comprehend how savage they can. I, I would never com- claim right. to understand that. It's just the quest to try and understand it is by reading books like your father's book. And, and this is what, you know, to bring it back to the book again and, then, and sure. the legacy of the book, because 
No, I said to you it, when we were exchanging emails, folks, I was saying to, to, to Henry that I, I, I didn't want to particularly focus on the TV show, although, of course, sure. it will come up in passing, because I think and I hope that the book is what will endure, because the book, right. the, the TV series is, is fine, and it, bre- it reached a, an audience that books can't do. And that's exactly. the thing that when we talk about history festivals or what I'm doing or, or, or a best-selling wartime memoir, they don't have the reach a movie or a TV show does, you know, sure. Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk and the 1917, a film and the new operation mincemeat film. And they have a global reach that, that books don't do. And books will, will become less and less the only way people absorb their history. It'll be things like this and Wikipedia entries right. and blogs and podcasts. And so, but the, the, the long lasting legacy of the, of your father's book is, 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 is I think assured because of, Nothing will ever take away, as I said earlier, that visceral rawness of how he wrote about it, even though it's difficult to read it. But it, it, there's people who have who have who are, who are in the sidebar. They're saying they're but they're buying the book. They haven't read the book. And and if you've been reading John McManus, James Holland, Alex Kirscher, whatever, sure. although they have passages with quite grim details there. Your father's book at times is unrelenting, isn't it? It just it, it th- is. there will be a little bit of humor every now and then that just kind of half takes the tension away, and then boom, you're straight back into it again. And and again, this is comes back to this idea I want to talk to you about this this mm-hmm. process of of writing it. So we, we I think we all know, and for those who don't know, you know, your father no- noted things down at the time and then started right. compiling notes and things, and then the finished book ended up coming in 81 so nearly 40 years later right but um did what was the writing that the in those last couple of years leading up to publishing who was it who came up with the idea of of this being a book that could be read by a wider number of people because was it your father's idea was it your mother's was it someone else who read in manuscript where at what point did the, did the family realize this needs to be read by other people my father started taking the notes and pieces of paper from his Bible early on after World War II and making an outline. Um, and then, and I mean, I don't even know if I was born yet when that started, but I do remember him sitting up late at night. He always wrote on yellow legal pads. Um, and I can remember him sitting up late at night and, and writing on these legal pads by the fireplace after my brother and I had gone to bed. And, and it just, it was like a faucet. It was like a fire hose. I mean, he would just write and write and write for hours and my mother at some point, I'm going to think in the early 70s, began to start typing it, okay? And as she typed it, and I, I will say this, Paul, I've said it before, I will continue to say it, the, the world has shown its gratitude to Eugene Sledge for the legacy he left, for the book that he left us to help us understand the world also owes a debt of gratitude to Jeannie Marie Arsenault Sledge, my mother, because she said, this is powerful. You should, we should try to get this published. And I can remember the manuscript sitting, I can remember right where it was in the house when we were growing up and my brother and I would pick up pages of it and read it. And, you know, we were always out in the woods playing army, you know, but we would pick up pages of it and read it. And when we, we, and and dad was a loquacious man he didn't mind talking and, and i don't mean about the blood and gut stuff i'm mm. talking i mean i would i had a lot of curiosity about the kind of equipment they carried and things like that and he he saved a lot of his artifacts as you know since yeah. pictures and, well, and folks we've got some great photos henry has supplied us of, of your, your his father's incredible well the souvenirs and the uniforms we'll do that later we'll do sure. that the finale yeah it's all all great stuff but um, I think my mom, as she began typing it, saw the power in it, and she said, "You should consider getting this published." And in his typically self-deprecating, self-effacing style, he said, "Nobody's going to want to read this. Who, who in the hell is going to want to read this? I'm leaving this as so you and Henry and John will have some understanding of what we went through." But but it really was kind of a two-tiered motivation because there was that but also as he said in that letter i referred to uh to stumpy stanley you know in 1980 he he said i I felt drawn to tell this story 
Um, and I know, Paul, I, to I told you that my mother and I have discussed this. He, he felt grieved by the fact that Peleliu was a forgotten battle mm. and deemed an unnecessary battle. And so many guys died there. And he, he wanted to tell that story and, and, and because he just felt like nobody had ever heard of it. And I would argue that now in 2021, thanks in part to his book and in part to the Pacific miniseries and other scholarship, you know, I would argue that that Peleliu is definitely not a forgotten battle anymore. No, I, I agree. I, I'm 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 doing some text for a photographic book that's coming out next year, and I had to write a little bit about Peleliu and really only a few paragraphs. And in my research, one of the things is said it's a forgotten battle, and you go, well, forgotten by whom? Because sure. It, 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 one and, time, and, yeah. and the debate about whether or not the landings there were necessary is another debate debate right. for another day. That doesn't – the guys on the ground fighting a battle don't decide which uh, units are moved on maps by generals. They and go admirals. where they're told. They go where they're told. And in the grand scheme of things, you can, you can make um, – rational arguments about shouldn't have done this should have done that should have done that earlier mm -hmm. should have done that later. that's fine that's for the that's for the students of of war in terms of an operational experience but in terms of the the human experience it's 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 very different and and you know, when you're talking about your mother's role there mm -hmm. another thing that i think is special about your father's writing and i hope people who are watching this who read the book people like brad from the on this day in military history channel is watching today is that your father at some point overcame the need for self-censorship because I've met hundreds of World War II veterans and especially around their families, there's a censorship thing in their brains that means they don't want to relate things in the completely graphic way that they experience because they don't want to upset anybody or hold back. And, and I've seen that time and time again where veterans have told a version of a story when their wives or children are, di are present, different to the one they would tell when they've got some of their comrades with them. Now, do you think when your father's writing, it, there was a conscious decision to not censor himself in, in terms of honesty? Because he does question, you know, the, the, the whole moral nature of war and is it murder and, and, and the, his, his feeling towards an enemy that were cruel and, and, and his his emotions of experiencing hatred and revenge and anger, all that comes across in your father's writing. Now, as again, do you think he, he had to overcome that or was that naturally part of the cathartic process? I think it was naturally part of the cathartic process because again, knowing him the way I did, <clears throat> um, he would not, when it, I knew when he put that story down, he wouldn't want to varnish anything. He would want to tell it, the way it really was. Um, it was not in his nature to cast a veneer upon something, if you will. Mm. Um, I, if you would let me, Paul, I've got a short letter that I'd like to read because absolutely go this please. because th this pertains. This book right here is called The Old Breed. It's by yeah. George McMillan. It's a First Marine Division unit history. Okay, every Marine Division had a unit history written by somebody different. George McMillan did the one on the 1st Marine Division. This is a real treasure because not only does it have notes from my father all through this thing, especially when you get to Pelo and Okinawa, and of course I can't find the damn page. Yeah, here's some a page you can see where he, maybe you can see that where he had yeah, written a lot of that. notes in it. He also sent, because Sid Phillips was 1st Marine Division, he sent this book to Sid, and Sid put his notes in it, if you can see that yep, just about. Yep. So, and then sits in his book to dad. So they, they put notes in each other's books. All right. Well, so the author of that book, George McMillan, anybody who's serious about Pacific war history would, would certainly understand the scholastic accuracy of a book like the old breed and all those Marine division unit histories. And early on, not after, not long after with the old breed was published, he sent it a copy of it to George McMillan. Okay, and this this go this is relevant, Paul, because it goes to your you know. Do you think he had any idea his book would have the impact it's had? So this letter dated June twenty first, nineteen eighty two, and in my father's own handwriting up here, he wrote, author of the old breed history of the first Marine Division of World War II. So George McMillan writes in this letter, dear Gene, you've written a good book. 
it reeks with the humility of a good infantryman, of one who has seen the worst of battle. It is honest and it is true. That photo of you on the dust jacket is great, capitalized great. Made me nearly weep with nostalgia. Made me think of all the days I sat like that on my cot at Pavuvu. Something makes me something makes me think that the book is going to carve out a place for itself in World War II literature. You haven't heard the last of it. Let me know well in advance of Bantam publication date. Maybe I can hit some kind of lick then. I'm honored you used Old Breed in your title and grateful for the dedication. Now write us another good book, Semper Fi G. That's a very prescient letter. Yeah. Um, and I actually just found that. My, my wife had, we had another copy of that book that my wife made sure I, that she saw that in there and made sure I saw this. So I got to wow. give her credit for me seeing that. But to go back to my mom, I mean, there was something about it that reached out to my mother and she, as she typed it, said, this is powerful stuff. I mean, we got to, we got to try to make it see the light of day. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, um, I'm drawn to the fact, I, I mean, I'm loving what we're doing, but we are getting some questions. So a couple of them came in about, um, did your father ever meet Bob Lecky uh, is one question. And and we can do that one. And then also, sure. what about the friendship with other members of, of, of his unit or, or from, from not necessarily from his own unit, but other people who'd served in the same theater? Because mm -hmm. obviously in a place like Alabama, uh, he's going to bump into people who also served in the Pacific. So did he, did a, was he friends with Bob Lecky and did he stick his other friendships with just fellow Marines or did he have a wider circle of people who've been in theater? Um, he short answer to the Bob Lecky question. They never met that yeah. I know of. Um, I can still picture that first edition with the cover of helmet for my pillow on his shelf. I read that book. It was one of the first Pacific war books I read. I was probably 12 or 13. Um, and, and I have his copy that he made notes in when he read it. Um, so he was certainly familiar with Lecky because, you know, Lecky kind of wrote that first, uh, Pacific war memoir, if you will. And so he, certainly he read it, but they never met that I know of. Um, and the second part of the question, you know, most of his friendships, of course, were going to be Marines, but anybody who reached out to him, I mean, I, God, I don't know how many times a week I would see him sitting down and answering letters. You know, he tried to answer every letter early on and it got to where he just couldn't do it. Uh, but you, so uh, Stumpy Stanley, who was company commander on Okinawa, I remember him calling the house and talking to my dad. Um, he and Snafu reunited. You know, mm -hmm. when the book got out there, Snafu became aware of it. I met Snafu in 1984 when I was just a college kid. I came home for the weekend and Snafu and his wife had come over from Louisiana to visit. And I walked in the house and I certainly knew who Snafu was. I, I had just a massive amount of respect for my dad's story. When, when, with the old breed came out, I mean, I read it, you know, mm. two or three times right off the bat. So I knew who all these guys were. And, you know, I walked in and I see this short stocky guy sitting there and my dad said, Snafu, this is my son, Henry. And, Henry, this is Snafu. And they, he didn't need to say anything else. I knew who Snafu was. And, you know, he's like, how you doing? Your daddy and I were good friends of World War II, you know. And it was it was just a really cool thing. And I, I wish, Paul, one of the great regrets of my life was that I didn't just sit down in that room and just sit there and listen to them talk. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was 20 years old. I had other things in my mind. But I, I shook his hand very respectfully and was truly happy to meet him. But, you know, I had other things in my mind. But... Uh, and then in 1993, when Snafu passed away, my dad was uh, a pallbearer in his funeral. Um, but Bill wow. Layden, another one, uh, he and Bill wow. Layden were very close. Uh, you know, and I can remember, and I got to know Bill, wonderful man. God, I loved him. He, you know, he would call Henry, it's Bill Layden. Can I talk to your father? You know, and he, he just had that great New York accent, you know, and, and, and actually Bill was one of the first people I called when my dad died. And, uh, you know, he, he was just, just quite taken aback with grief, you know, and, um, uh, but there were a lot of others, you know, it was, uh, a lot of late night phone conversations that my dad would have. Mm. Uh, I think sometimes to the chagrin of my mother, you know, cause he'd be, 
it was ironic because my dad hated talking on the phone. You know, if my brother and I called him in later life, you know, hey, dad, what's going on? <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. OK. All right. What do you need? You know, he just he hated talking on the phone. But when one of these Marines called him in earlier years, you know, in the in the nascent stages of the book and not long after it was published. I mean, just forget it. He's in there with the door closed and they're, you know, talking. And it was but it was a good thing, Paul, because you could hear him just guff on and laughing, you know, and. Uh, but if I can share a little anecdote with you, I remember uh, walking over to uh, the college campus where he taught, University of Montevallo, and I heard him, I was walking down the hall and I heard him on the phone, or he, no, he was having a face-to-face -face conversation with a student who had been a Marine in Vietnam. And I could just, the way my dad was talking, I he just, I could tell he was, talking to somebody only who had experienced what he had experienced. And you have to understand my dad, I'm not going to say he never cursed, but he did not use four letter words. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to say anything really bad here, but I, I do, I do want to repeat what I heard him say because I'd never heard my father talk like this. And as I'm walking up to the door of his office and the door was open, it was not closed. And I heard him say something about, yeah, I knew him pretty well on Peleliu. He got the shit knocked out of him by a close shell burst. And it, it you know, it kind of, I was like, wow, man, I've never heard dad talk like that. And and then I kind of stuck my head around the corner. I'm like, hey, dad, you know, like, hey, big shot, come on in. You know, he always called me big shot. I have no idea why. <laughs> but <laughs> that was his nickname for me my whole life. But, but then I walked in, he introduced me to whoever he was talking to. But, um, you know, just a little, I'm just trying to give you a little anecdote. Yeah, no, being and, the son, I mean. and the fact that he was able to have these kind of almost raucous conversations by telephone with his buddies is good right. because being the scientist, and you said earlier on, that is probably how he'd like to define himself. Scientists is all about putting things in their categories, isn't it? Right. Definitions. And, and, and he's an ornithologist and botany. So this is the so-and-so classification. So where, where when when veterans are dealing with horrible memories, the thing is, they're also sometimes mixed up with the good memories as well. I suppose right. in your father's case, the book was the right. Now, here's the bad memories. And there was almost something kind of symbolic about handing over the, ma the manuscript. It is, that's now done now. That's right. done that bit now. You want to know what I was thinking about on Fox in, in a Fox on Perlu? It's in the book now. Now we can just talk about the shared friendships. Now we can just talk about the 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 we don't have to say what needs to be said now. We can just talk to Snafu or someone else and we can just chew the fat, have a laugh and talk about mm -hmm. the things we <clears throat> talked about in the downtime when there was downtime and there was a bit more relaxation. So by compartmentalizing it like that, mm -hmm. I'm hoping that your father was able to say, okay, this, this is now been done. That bit's now been that that's been processed. Um, sure. And, and he, yeah, he was. And I mean, that's the thing, the, the thing people don't realize. And, and I, I, feel very strongly about trying to convey this for all the PTSD and all of the, the angst that we know that, that the man had to deal with and all these guys uh, had to deal with. He had a sense of humor that few, few people can imagine to say that he was a lively man with a wonderful sense of humor doesn't even do it justice. Mm. And so talking about the war, you know, it wasn't all just, Oh my God, there's this awful story I want to share with. It wasn't like that at all. You know, again, I, you know, my brother and I always had a lot of curious about military curiosity about military history. And, you know, I, I would run around in the woods and play army, you know, like, like I told you about it. And that one incident, I was, I was the only time anything like that ever happened. You know, I would ask him about, dad, did you ever carry a Tommy gun? You know, when I was younger and he would say, yeah, you know, and, but he never called it a Tommy gun. He called it a Thompson. And he said, you know, uh, of course, Mortimer were not issued Thompsons, but he said, Snafu and I got one. They were issued one per squad and Snafu and I got one and we kind of traded off with it on Okinawa. Wow. Um, the 45 that my grandfather sent him, um, you know, that is the first pistol I ever shot. And I remember the day he took me out and taught me to shoot it. And it, it was years before he, because I kept begging him to let me shoot it. And he said, and, and, you know, we had woods behind our house. We could, my brother and I could do a lot of plinking and stuff with our 22 rifles when we were kids. 
but the the pistol i can remember my dad saying look a pistol is like a snake it can turn around and bite you you know i'll let you shoot it i'll teach you but but we're not going to do it yet but i mean he god his his standards of safety were drilled into us and it's what he learned on that firing line of marine corps boot camp training uh you know the scene where haney goes up to the lieutenant on pavuvu you know and uses a bunch of <laughs> epithets and says what he'll do with the pistol because the lieutenant kind of you know veered over with the barrel i mean that i mean my father never did it like that but he he just drilled it into my head you do not point that weapon anywhere other than downrange um but you know i mean it or, or a question about like i i might go to an army surplus store and see something and you know one time i remember we went in one in mobile and i mean i i was probably five six years old so my brother would have been about 12 and uh, you know, and of course, we're talking early 70s. So think about it, Paul. There was a lot mm-hmm. of World War II surplus in those stores. I mean, think about that now. I mean, how cool would that yeah, the, be? Yeah, the, the, the golden age we all had. Yes. Those were a certain age. I went to school with my, my, my school bag was a World War II British Army respirator back and i kept my school pencils much in the in the little pockets for it yeah we, we all did that and yeah i mean it's i, I want to bring it back to you you know your stories about your father being witty and humorous is so sure. important because again the the public the, the there's a public eb sledge that is out there i'm i'm looking right. i'm currently looking at the wikipedia entry right now and it's there a millions can read it, and it says. This is what I'm reading it right now. It says, "Post war, it talks about the universe." It says, "Sledge had a hard time readjusting to civilian life." Then there's a quote, and then it's about the fact he no longer wanted to go hunting. And it, but there's only it's like three paragraphs there about your father's post war life, and then it talks about his achievements in the science world. And sure. what we're now understanding, and this is why I can, I'm guess I this is why you're happy to do these kind of podcasts and things like mm-hmm. that is is a to broaden out that your your father what wasn't some torture he wasn't Vincent Van Gogh some tortured artist who 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 spent his entire life as a recluse and this is his weird no. what book he was a multifaceted human being and I think this is the interesting thing about when we when we revere a book like this book and I did I'm I'm saying how what an amazing book it is and how influential it has been to a whole generation or well several generations of military historians now we only know the part of his life that he cared to reveal to us in a book there and the little bits he did here and there. And, you know, there was a second book, of course, about China, but sure. You know, th- this is why it's so important that, that there there's that the public get to know there is a person beyond the, 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 the PTSD suffering guy who gave us a captivating memoir. Right. Absolutely. And I, it's like, I, I like to point out to people, you know, I, I'm so used to hearing my father referred to as, well, Sledge did this and, and Sledge wrote this book and Sledge shared this with us. And well, you know, in Sledge's book, they did this. And certainly, you know, in the, the HBO miniseries, and there are times when I just want to say, you guys are talking about my dad like he was an asset. Yeah. And and I don't mean this in a bad way. Okay. No, no, it's know, all good. I mean. yeah, I'm glad yeah. all of this has happened, but I want to say the guy you're referring to is the guy who taught me how to ride a bike. Yeah. He's the guy who taught me how to shoot a BB gun in the backyard when I was, you know, seven years old. I, I mean, I remember him reading Peter Cottontail stories to me. Yeah. So certainly the human side to it. And, and that is all a good thing. I don't say that to cast a macabre air on anything at all. Um, because talking about his World War II legacy is something I feel very passionate about and I love doing it. But I, I do, I, I am so glad. I mean, you're, you're spot on, Paul. I mean, no, he was not this tortured individual who, you know, and, and sadly, I think there were guys who, who, who struggle with that. But, you know, it's very edifying to me uh, when people say that who, who are now young combat vets um, that my dad's book helped them deal with some of their issues. I, yeah. I think that would, that would be very gratifying to him. I mean, it, it was a part of his life, but it didn't define him. I think is how it, I no, would, not at all. It, it was, it was important to him. The, the the legacy of of the friendships he made, the the experiences were harrowing and they were awful. But you know, the, that's the way. The other thing about World War II veterans is it, no matter how tortured they are, 
they can have that satisfaction of knowing that the world was a better place because of their deeds. Sure. Which, when we're talking about the, the future wars, and let's not go down a, the rabbit hole of talking about the v Vietnam or British right. Empire battles in Malaya, and, but World War II was a, was just in that sense. There, there was an evil out there that had to be vanquished. Anybody who came back who'd been part of that had that trying to hold on to all oh, of course there's the, the the awful things they'd experienced the the, the scenes they'd witnessed and wh when i have a, on my tours in normally when someone comes along and says, oh my grandfather my uncle my mom was in the so-and-so there but i don't think they saw much you think well they did you say they did. just because they didn't talk about it, even if they were they were you know on a transport ship or something doesn't mean they were immune to the suffering around them some had it worse than others your father was absolutely at the sharp end but even those who were further back still saw that same sure. same horror. And and that's another thing I want to say about your father's book, and is that some memoirs by people within units that are very, very based on esprit de corps, so Marines, Rangers, Paris, they can be a little bit, and everybody else was a bit crap. They can come across a little bit, um, our unit were the best, and the yeah, those army your father manages to, to to convey his pride in being a marine alongside the fact that he is part of a greater a greater a greater effort, um, yeah. effort and and yeah. that those people that are serving the, the 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 chow on the on the troop ship are still part of the same effort and the people that it doesn't come across that he's feeling better than other people and some memoirs i've read are a little bit and our unit was the best and everybody else was was awful and that right. that, that can be off putting to other people it can. a lot of people who i've i've met people who didn't have anything like as dramatic wars as your father who have got something out of your father's book because they weren't they weren't pushed away by it does that make sense it, it, as well absolutely i mean it's not alienating yeah and and that's a good point now you know my father had fierce pride in the marine corps i mean you know, I can remember walking in his office uh, as a kid over at the University of Montevallo, and there was, a, you know, one of those institutional metal filing cabinets there and uh, with the sliding glass doors. And on the end of it, there was this maroon colored bumper sticker that said, I can, you know, it was there my whole life that he taught there. When you're the finest, it's hard to be uh, humble in the United States Marine Corps. Um, you know, and, and he had a fierce pride in the Marine Corps. He had an EGA on his on his belt till the day he died um the the cap his hbt cap um which i think i sent you pictures of there's a picture of me out in the backyard and the house my family lived in at that time and i was probably yeah that right there um i might have been four years old and there's a and there's a picture of my dad with his denim work jacket you know um and and that hat uh, because he would wear that when i was a kid he'd wear it out in the yard you know he didn't wear it out in public um, but you know, and I will kind of share this. So he had on Okinawa, they were issued these heavy green, uh, woolen blankets and they had USMC stenciled on them. And, uh, I always thought the, the Marine Corps blankets were so cool. But one time when I was a kid, I referred to it as his army blanket Ooh. and, <laughs> you know, no disrespect to our army friends out there, but he said, big shot. It's a Marine Corps blanket. Don't you ever call it that again. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, again, that was with a tinge of humor. You know, he and I do think he did a good job of of not wanting to alienate anyone. Uh, I do remember him getting a letter probably back in the 80s where someone uh, my, my dad does refer to the rear echelon guys hmm. and and with the old breed, he does refer to them <clears throat> and. You know, if he were sitting here today, he would tell you, look, man, they had just as important a job to do as any of the rest of us. But I mean, let's be honest, when you're at the sharp end, as you put it, and you're taking fire every day and, and at night too, and dealing with infiltrators, you know, you're going to have some feelings about the guys who are further back. I mean, it's inevitable. OK, yeah. and I, there I do remember a story and I I don't know if it's in with the old breed or if it's some never before seen material. Uh, but he, t he told the story either to us as a family, or maybe, like I said, I can't remember if it's in his book or not. They're, you know, getting ready to, he and Snafu and all the other guys are eating their K rations or whatever, getting ready to, to, you know, 
dig in for the night. And I think this was on Peleliu. And a couple of guys come walking through and they're, I mean, it's just immediately you could tell these guys were clean shaven. They had clean dungarees and they, they just kind of, they come walking through and look at my dad and his buddies. Like they're a bunch of rabid wild animals. And my dad and Snafu were looking at him like, who are these guys? What are they doing? And these guys, they kind of get about 10 yards out past my dad's foxhole. And one of them turns around and says, Hey buddy, can you tell me where the front lines are? We're, we're just kind of wanting to see if we can find some good Jap souvenirs. And my dad said, yeah, you just walk through them. And he said, these guys literally ran as fast as they could back the other direction. I mean, they were gone. They never saw them again. Wow. Um, no, no disrespect to any rear echelon guys, but I mean, you know, it, 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 yeah, but they, you know, they're they're part of the effort, and your father was able to recognize that, even though they hadn't experienced some of the same sure. stuff. So, you, you talked about Peleliu there, and and one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, you know, you did visit there yourself. Well, through 2010, I think it was you went. No, it was there. 2000. So, it was 1999. Oh, yeah, okay, 1999. So, 55th anniversary. So, you know, uh, without sounding like the trite interviewer, how was that for you, Henry? But you know, what was it like there going that? Because you know, you'd it's something to go to a battlefield whether you have a connection with it or not there's yes. thousands who've been to battlefields who have no personal connection at all who are absolutely blown away by standing at somewhere where so much history happened but in your right. case you're going to somewhere somewhere that your father had been through some of the most incredible moments of his life and not only that had been talking you know writing about them and 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 so what was that like? I mean, what, what when you when you got off the boat there and walked those places that he'd written about? I mean, just mm-hmm. share some. Oh God, it that was going to Peleliu is probably one of the coolest things I've ever done. I mean, so I I can remember being a teenager telling my mom one day I want to go to Peleliu because there was just something about this far flung island that that was so sparsely inhabited. And you, you, you just had to know that the detritus of war was everywhere, even to this day. And I, I, I just was fascinated at wanting to go there. And so when I was 35 in 1999, that became a reality. So uh, it, was, it was a military historical tours trip. And I can remember planning it. Or actually, my dad knew that I wanted to go. And he showed me a flyer that came in the mail because they sent it to him. And I can't, I'd gone down to my parents' house to visit them that day. And he said, hey, here's they're doing a 55th anniversary trip. You know, I don't know if you're interested in going, but you have kind of talked about it. And, of course, I'm just like, hell yeah, I'm there. And so I started in Joseph Alexander. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He was on that trip. I became very good friends with Colonel Joseph Alexander. Uh, such good friends that I actually named my son after him. Um, <clears throat> but Joe, uh, who wrote Storm Landings and Utmost Savagery about Tarawa, uh, just a very uh, – very high ranked Pacific war scholar. Uh, he was on the trip and, uh, I can remember as we were planning it, the, the tour organizers were, you know, they saw my name on, on the application and were just, they called me and they were just thrilled about it. And they said, well, if your father wants to go, well, you know, he's got an all expense paid trip if he wants to go. And here's an example of his glib sense of humor. Uh, I told him that, uh, you know, because I kind of thought, well, it, it I think I know how he's going to react, but it would be kind of cool to go with him. And he, you know, he just said, you tell them I've already had an all expense paid trip to Peleliu. But (laughs) he, he, he thought it was so cool that I wanted to go. And that was the awesome thing about my dad. Uh, I don't want to get off down the whole thing about hunting. Okay. But you know, he didn't hunt. We know that He, he actually did hunt a few times after the war, but it was not a thing he wanted to do. I started deer hunting briefly when, when I was in my twenties, it wasn't something I stuck with. He thought it was great. He totally supported it, you know, but to go back to Peleliu, um, to, to, I remember going to, it was a good friend of mine or a guy that I became good friends with named Eric Maylander, who was on that trip. I hope he's watching, but th- that guy is the expert on Peleliu bar none in my opinion. And er- I got to know Eric Maylander on that trip. He had reached out to my dad prior to, uh, because he had some questions about some things he was researching. Um, and, you know, I'm like, Eric, take me to Orange Beach too. 
you know, I wanted to go where dad came ashore and, you know, that I, I don't know what it is. The landing beach is always such a visceral uh, spot, you know, cause that's where it all started. And I just to stand there on orange beach too, you know, and know that, that that's about where he came ashore was just so powerful. And then to walk, you know, a little ways down the beach. And when we, Eric took me to the point, you know, which of course was K11, K Company First Battalion, First Marines, George P. Hunt, when Carl comes high, uh, an iconic place. Um, I mean, the Japanese just laid down some horrifically enfilading fire on, on First Marines, you know, and that was farther north than where K35 went ashore on Orange Beach. But um, I can remember, you know, the, the Carl was so jagged. And, and the water, you know, there really was no sand on White Beach, if I, if I recall. But I can remember at one point, Eric was just like, Henry, imagine right here where you're standing, there were 50 dead Marines in this spot. Um, another, and I'm just trying to hit, hit the check the high points here, another iconic spot, of course, was the airfield, you know, mm-hmm. uh, which was depicted in, in horrific detail in the HBO miniseries. And my father wrote about it. You know, he talked about, tracer snapping by viciously at chair rail height and uh you know the pieces of shrapnel growling through the air and and just the maelstrom of flashes and one continuous thunderous clap after another and you know he said it was i mean i I literally this stuff is coded into my dna i mean i can read somebody else's book where they quote my dad and know not even see his name and already know they're talking about eugene sledge i mean (laughs) it is just part of who i am and or maybe because I've just read it so many times, but and other books, too. I mean, I have such a passion for this history. But uh, to, to go and I remember asking Eric, I said, hey, I want to take me to the part of the airfield where K-35 would have gone across. And then he did. He put me right there. And uh, it was it was just I mean, I just walked around in that spot, Paul. I mean, I just aimlessly walked around and just tried to soak it all in. And I looked up. To the north, where where they would have been, I guess the northwest, where the Umar Brogel would have been, and and just tried to think about all that murderous, you know, I guess a lot of it was twenty five millimeter fire coming down on them, and seventy five millimeter fire, and then mortar fire, and just, and then of course as the trip progressed, you know, we went up in Bloody Nose Ridge, and we saw a lot of those gun emplacements, and. Um, you know, without a doubt, the one place I didn't get to see was Hill 140 where, where Akak was killed. But, uh, you know, so many caves that we saw, the horseshoe, you know, which, of course, is heavily overgrown now. But, I mean, there's some iconic video of 3-5 pushing into the horseshoe, you know, supported by tanks from the 710th Tank Battalion. Uh, and actually, Gil Lindloff was on that trip, and he was uh, – his tank – is on Peleliu upended. It's the one you've probably seen pictures of, mm. Paul. Yeah, it ran. It, yep, that's Gil Linloff's tank from the 710th Tank Battalion. He was on that trip, and I had the. It's oh. actually now I've seen pictures. They've cleared out around it, but I mean, we back in 1999, things were a little more virginal on the on the island, and so to to just you know, Eric's like, yeah, we're going we're going to see Gil's tank, and we're just walking through the jungle, and then boom, there it is. I mean. You know, for me, coming from Birmingham, Alabama, to walk to just stumble through the jungle, and here's a an M4 tank with the guts blown out of it, still up on its side, you know, where, still in its place where it happened, you know, and burned for two days, and, and several members of the crew, you know, tragically died in that incident. I mean, uh, and to see shell casings everywhere, and I know we went into, I think it was, it was either Hill 210 or <clears throat> it was the coral badlands, I think is what Eric Maylander said it was called. And he had seen all these sites before he had been there many times prior to that. Um, we saw a 30 cal water cool machine gun still in, in its emplacement with the remains of an ammo belt still in the breach. Wow. And I have pictures of that. We, we need to do a separate show about that trip. No, we could. I and mean, if you've got photos, we could do that. And, and yeah. one of the things I want to is, is that it must've been, it, although it was your first visit there, it must have felt like it was a return visit because your father had written about it so well. Yes, it, it must have. There must have been a familiarization process of this is exactly how your your it father was. described it. And and this is I want to bring it back to this idea of the legacy of your father's books because you know we talked before going online about you've been working with Sol David, who's done a show with me. We love Sol David's history and right. 
there, there are veterans' memoirs from periods after the war that are now not being used as much by historians because perhaps their visual descriptions weren't as correct. Because there was an era, perhaps when people were writing about the Pacific in, let's say, the 1960s and 70s, when the world couldn't get to these places. So if the veteran right. described a mountain as being full of green foliage and steep sides, everyone took it at face value as how the veteran described it. Now, of course, we have Google Earth, we have images, right. we have, and there are now veterans, I'm not going to name any veterans' memoirs, there are veterans' sure. memoirs that perhaps are still very visceral in terms of their, of their emotional descriptions, but the, the, the physical descriptions are now incorrect because they just remembered it incorrectly. Now, here's the amazing thing about your father's work is it's still holding up. It's yes. still holding up both viscerally and, in, and emotionally, but it's still holding up in, in descriptively as well. So if someone is writing a book about Peleliu or Okinawa and they insert a line or two of your father's book, it will match up with the physical description of that. Now, that, again, is a rare quality for someone to be able to re relate, relate the, the emotional experience but also get the visual detail correct as well because I've read other accounts where the visual direct detail is great, but they're, they're writing very dryly. In other ones, where the other way around. But again, your father did both. He got the the descriptive stuff. So, I mean, you talked about him being a scientist after the war. He must have had as a child a sense of detail. And 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 mm -hmm. when he, if he was, I don't know whether he did any drawings when he was a kid. But I imagine they were they were very good and very precise. And I, I imagine him being thorough. Is that is that yes. fair? Yes, as like a lot of biologists, scientists, yeah. he did draw some and, and actually was pretty good at it. Uh, but yeah, people have commented on his ability to note detail and and describe it. And and I, I do think a lot of that stemmed from his training as a scientist. Mm. And and not only that, but to get the details right and, and be accurate. But uh <clears throat> You know, without a doubt. I mean, he had a he had a, a penchant for that. And, and this is why, you know, to, we, 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 when we talk about the legacy, and I want to say two questions. One is, you you said earlier why it is important for you to carry on talking about your father's legacy in the book. So, so the first question is, why is it important for you to what? What's the single thing you're trying to achieve? You're not your father. You're you're right. you, you, you 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 didn't have the same experiences, and sure. in some ways you only have, apart from your childhood, the same raw data we have to process. The book is, mm -hmm. I know there's, you said there's some letters and things, but what, but you have this insight to him as a human being. So, but, so what is, what is your, why, what's your reason for doing this kind of show with me? I, I guess part of it is, well, number one, I have an inherent love for World War II history and it's not just the Pacific, but European ETO as well. But that's tangential to your question. Um, I, you know, I, I have this fear that when that last World War II veteran dies, that maybe this healthy interest in World War II might fade away. And I don't want to see that happen. That's why I'm so appreciative of people like yourself doing what you do, because you're not just doing high level. Oh, you wrote this book. Tell me about the book. Or your dad wrote, you know. I mean, Paul, you get granular. I mean, I've looked at a lot of your shows, man. You take, you get pretty granular in your detail. And I find that very appealing. I mean, you know, you're up, don't you have an upcoming show on the Battle of the Bismarck Sea? Didn't I see that? We have that, that next week. Yep, yep. Yeah, yep. I can't wait to watch that. I mean, you know, there are aspects of it that you delve into that a lot of people don't. But I just, I want to, I mean, apart from the fact that I just have a, an endemic fascination for the history, um, I just, I don't want it to ever become something that people stop talking about. And, you know, I do, I, I guess, you know, it, it's edifying to me. It's gratifying to me that, that people seem to take an interest in my dad's book and to see the way it's, <clears throat> um, you know, been, been lionized, if you will, and admired so much. And there's just something in me that wants to provide a little extra context to that. Uh, I mean, you're right. I'm not my father. You know, it's I was I put something on Facebook the other day about my dad. Well, it was his birthday yesterday, as a matter of fact. And somebody posted a message and said, would you come talk to our Rotary Club? Um, and I said, you know, I, I do Zoom shows. I do podcasts. I actually co-host a podcast with a couple of guys. Um, 
I do radio interviews, done TV interviews more than more times than I can count. And I enjoy doing all of it, but I don't do a lot of public speaking because I, and I got invited after doing another show, invited to talk to a veterans group. And I just said, you know, I have never served. I've never worn the uniform. I've never been shot at. I'm not going to stand in a room full of veterans and try to prop myself up like, oh, here, I can tell you something you didn't know. I'm I'm not even going to try that, you know, but I still just have, I don't know, there's something in me and it, it goes beyond just wanting to do this. I mean, there's an aspect of my dad's work that that I'm starting to research and you know, maybe that's a conversation for, for much later because I hope it'll turn into something, but it, it's too early to say. Well, that, someone was saying, you know, you should write a book about your father or you should well, do something. So, so that has already come up in the sidebar. And it's a, it seems an obvious progression to me. It seems it seems a natural <laughs> natural thing to move on to uh, and, and give us give us more. Uh, what we sure. have, if, if, if we only had your, if your father had never married, never had ch children, well, that, the book wouldn't have come about but sure. let's if we only had the book we'd still have a lot but sure. if we could get something beyond that as well because as i say that there, there are more books are coming out on world war ii than, than i can even try to keep up with it's and amazing everything from being brilliant to good to yeah another one about different types of engine and a certain type of aircraft and but anything and I think those who support me on Patreon, those who have their own channels, anything that reminds us of the human element of warfare and what it does to people and how it affects people is important. And, you know, I've never served. I've never fired a weapon in anger. I've never had anyone shell me. And, and I will never, ever claim that I can understand what it was like. I've been, I've been, exactly. I've, I've had moments of profound, um, not understanding, but empathy. You know, when Alina was on talking a few weeks ago about the use of Zyklon via Auschwitz and reading some of the, I felt a little bit of a connection with the horror, but, you know, I'm not going to stand here and say, oh, I know what it was like to be, you know, taken on a train to a concentration sure. camp or a death camp or to what it was like to to look over the front of a bow of a landing craft as you pull up to, to wherever beach it is and where island it is. That's, that's something I can't do. But, um, so yeah, we we you, that's why you do it. It's carrying on the legacy. But with the with the book, the long term legacy of this is, I think we we've we've, un, we've we've established that already. It's about the emotional response of a human being to warfare is something that your father did. And um, with with regards to um, the long term, say the long term in in fifty years time, mm -hmm. do you think the I like to think the book will still be relevant. I think the book will outlast the TV show. I really do. Um, and if if that is if it, if that is what's going to happen, that must be something that you and your children and your families, the next generation of sledges, mm -hmm. will be will be very very proud of. I mean, is is there what what's it like being part of the the wider sledge circle now, being connected to Eugene? Well, it's I mean, it's always an honor. You know, uh, in, in fact, we I'll use this to uh, try to address that uh, on the podcast that I co-host. What's the scuttlebutt? Um, we had a guest on a few weeks ago, a young Marine. He's a, a serving Marine, currently active duty serving Marine. And uh, my co-host, Don, said, well, Dylan, is there anything you want to ask Henry? I mean, you're, you know, you're sitting here with Eugene Sledge's son. A lot of Marines would probably like to talk to him or just ask him something. And. This young man said, well, yeah, Henry, well, when did it click for you? You know, being the son of Eugene Sledge, he said, mm -hmm. your your father is somebody who has almost, and I almost feel hesitant to say this, you know, but I'm telling you what was said to me. Your father is someone who has almost godlike status in the Marine Corps. Yeah. And if my father could hear that, he would shake his head and just go, not, not me. I don't, you know, but. This young man asked me, he said, what is that like for you? When did it click for you that your father was who he was? And and I answered him by saying, well, pretty early on, because I always had a profound interest in World War II history and a profound respect for what he had been through. I was blessed uh, in, in many ways having the dad that I had, because not only was he willing to talk about it, um, but he did save a lot of his artifacts. And so I was able to have these, these tangible reminders of that. But um, 
you know, it's it, it's a humbling thing, Paul. I mean, sometimes I feel like it's a lot to carry around. I, I get that, and I and I and I, you know, the friendship I got with some of the Band of Brothers veterans that they felt as privileged as they had been to travel around the world and share the experiences, they felt a bit burdened by it and their families still continue to feel a bit burdened by this. And that's why it's important to, 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 you can be put on too much of a pedestal. And I, and I, and I, I don't, I've had people kind of gushing that these, the, the greatest generation are like superheroes and you go, I see where you're going with this, and I right. see that your respect is huge for them, but you must be grounded in the fact they still, you know, were terrified. They were human beings. They exactly they, they had to go to the toilet you know, twice a day and wipe their ass. Like when, when my dad would tell me as a kid, you know, the queen you know, the queen is better now. She she wipes her ass once a day like the rest of us, he would say, you know, reminding <laughs> us that everybody is a human being. I think that's why. The, the the reverence for the gener greatest generation comes with that downside of us of us elevating them to some kind of superhero status sure. where they weren't affected and they weren't wounded by this. They're not. They're not. They haven't been. They weren't Superman. They hadn't been. They weren't from Krypton. They were. They hadn't been bitten by radioactive spiders to give them superpowers. That's right. And anything they did was through their own human endeavor, and I think that's why mm -hmm. talking to people like yourself. And reminding us that your father was a scientist and he taught you how to ride a bike is so important to to balance this reverence we have with them of the fact that he was a father, he was a he was a an educator, he was a friend to people, he and he had a sense of humor. So important. Yeah, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I am with you in 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 huge, massive admiration for the greatest generation. But but you're right. They were not perfect. They were human beings. I mean you know they're well but it is something i'm i'm always cognizant of and always aware of but um you know it it's um i have such gratitude for all the admiration that people do express for his book i mean mm -hmm. um and and i do it, it's funny i mean because when the pacific first came out uh, and bruce mckenna and i've had this conversation i really didn't like it at first i do like it now but I had to get to that point. And then that's a separate conversation. But where I wanted to go with that was to say this, uh, as I pointed out to my, my family in over the years, I'm like, you know, not many people come up to me and go, man, I finally got around to watching that, that HBO miniseries. But people come up to me all the time and go, man, I've read your dad's book. Mm. And that speaks exactly to what you said, Paul, that the book and no disrespect to the miniseries because I think they did a fine job. It, well, I think it was a great project, but you're right. I, the, the book, there's just something, I, I hope there's something timeless about it. Um, I hope that that will always continue. You know, I mean, I, I, and the interest that we see in, in World War II history. I mean, I hope that's not something that, you know, will begin to die off with, with those veterans. I don't think so. I mean, I, th I think it will change. I think it will evolve. I mean, you could you could definitely make the case that some of the best writing about the U.S. Civil War has been in you know, hunt, you know, a long time after the veterans passed away and the survivors passed away and their kids okay. have passed away. So I think I think it'll be reevaluated, and I think I think we don't know quite how it'll be studied and how it'll be talked about, uh, but I think it will be talked about, and I think. If we're going to bring this show to an end, the, which we will do shortly, while we have these incredible books, we have a handful of books that do stand on a on a level above just the hundreds and hundreds of books mm -hmm. that tell a battle written by brilliant historians. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, um, and, I, and these books are my bread and butter. I can they have them come in and and I read them and I enjoy them and I learn from them. But it's the it's this that little category of books of people who are actually there. Who, but also were able to write about it accurately because just mm -hmm. because you were there doesn't mean you have a the ability to write about it in a way that's engaging and b you're actually going to get them get it right because right. we know there are veterans memoirs that that they've been confused over actions they've got things wrong they they, they say they describe things physically incorrectly but but they're still useful but your father's book is in that category of of a handful that are that are something special. Um, so I, I think we definitely should book you to come and talk about your visit to Peleliu and 
and talk, go into greater detail about that. Um, anything else you feel you you haven't got across about your father or the book that you'd like to? Well, we've got this opportunity today. Sure, I, man, I'm having a blast. I mean, you wrap it up when you need to wrap it up, Paul. Well, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's I, I mean, I think it's it's a question of kind of leaving leaving the audience wanting more in some ways. I think. Did, I are there any questions from... from the audience that we that maybe? Yeah, okay, I can... yeah, let's do that. Yeah, folks, if you've got any qu questions, to kind of the next last ten minutes, fifteen minutes, anything you want to ask, I think I've tried to catch up with the ones the main ones about your father did he did he know bob lecky we've done that mm -hmm. one but folks if you've got any questions there we'll we'll um we'll do that but um it's gratifying to me by the way saying that you appreciate what i'm doing because i i it, it's an it's an endless effort and sometimes yeah, no, I, I, I can I'm see that i mean out, but. if i ever uh you know my, my buddies leighton hughes and matt leach if i ever get across to, to visit Leighton, you know, and get to see Normandy, which I hope I do. I mean, I really want to go to the Ardennes. My uncle was in the Battle of the Bulge, my dad's older brother. Yeah. Uh, he was a tank commander. I mean, uh, and won the Bronze Star and Silver Star and Three Purple Hearts. But, um, you know, I would love to tour the Ardennes. Do you do battlefield tours in the Ardennes? I can do. I mean, I, I don't, I tend to pass it on to someone else, but um, yeah, stick to Normandy. Specialist. I stink. I stick to Normandy myself, but I, I have been there and I can tour there, but yeah, no, definitely. Matt, Matt Leach is a buddy of mine. We've met up and had a couple of beers together and mm -hmm. Leighton I've not met, but yeah, he's watching as well. So, you know, um, uh, yeah, de definitely traveling and, un and understanding battlefields is important. And uh, yeah. And, and we could have talked about your uncle. We could have talked about that as well because. Oh, sure. Uh, and the other people that say that that from from your part of Alabama that went to war and had experiences that would have felt your father's book spoke to them. It's in, it, it's important. <clears throat> so, well, we have one question there. So, Trent Alenko, did Sedge ever talk the mortar ammunition? Talk about the mortar ammunition shortages on Okinawa? I don't remember that he did to me personally, but um, that that's not something that jumps out at me is him and me having conversations about and we we did have a lot of conversations about many aspects mm -hmm. of it but if if i'm just trying to imagine what he would say i guess um with the horrific mud and rain conditions and just trying to physically get the needed ammunition to the front lines um maybe there were some difficulties there but uh he and i never like really discussed that aspect of it specifically mm. i mean we you talked about the fact that he was a bit dismissive of the war films, and I completely understand that. And obviously he'd read the old breed, the official unit history, but did he, did he read widely about military history himself? I mean, not yes. just world war two. So because that was something when we did a show about a year ago now, about a year this week about Spike Milligan, who is a, a British legend. He was a comedian in the fifties and sixties and seventies mm -hmm. and his book, um, Adolf Hitler, my part in his downfall is a comedy memoir. And yet within the comedy are some harrowing, seven volumes, are harrowing descriptions of, of the fighting in North Africa and Tunisia and Italy. And Spike Milligan, when he was writing his memoirs, which he made to, he wrote to make people laugh. That was his, that was his primary reason. He also had this massive library of military histories he could draw on. So people again talk about his books as being very accurate. I did a show about North Africa with Edmund O'Sullivan recently. We were talking about Spike Milligan's description of Tunisia as mm -hmm. being very, 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 very accurate. Um, so, so your father did have interest in military history, but not the war. Absolutely. Films. That's, that's interesting, isn't it? A absolutely. Um, yeah, he, <clears throat> well, that was the thing. I mean, he was so intellectually, I think on another plane from, from, a lot of folks. I mean, uh, he was very well read in general. You know, I know Winston Churchill's work. He read that. Mm. Um, he read about the Civil War. He read about World War One and and other World War Two books. But yes, he was very interested in military history. And you know, I think all of that it could be said was grist for the mill and helping him develop with the old breed. Yeah. And one last question from Brad from On This Day in Military History. Is the scene at the end of the series about his trouble with college regist registration, does that have any truth to it? Yes, it happened exactly the way they they did it. Except I can remember my dad telling that story out of his in his own words. And the way they did it in the Pacific was good. But when the young lady, uh, and I went to Auburn myself, but w when the young lady went through this list of things, you know, and got to the, did, did, didn't the Marines teach you anything? 
and where he says, lady, they taught me how to kill Japs. You know, he said it a lot louder than they said it in the miniseries. And he said, you know, there, you could have heard a pin drop in that room. And he kind of checked himself and she just had this shocked look on her face. And, you know, because there was nobody, everybody else in the room is in civilian clothes, which he was too. He wasn't wearing his uniform, but none of the other people in there had, had been in the military. Uh, but he said, you could have heard a pin drop. And then he, he kind of dialed it back and said, there was a killing, there was a killing war going on and I had to do some of the killing. Mm. But, I mean, but that, the answer that, to the that, question is yes. But, yeah, I mean that's fascinating. In that in that era we're talking about, to, everybody had come back with some kind of. I mean, sure, America, sixteen million Americans had come back from war for, at different levels of. You know, we talked about at the sharp end and and rear, rear echelon, but to, to, that's an odd, it was an odd situation for that to have come up in. But I think we will think end things now, so we can we can bring you back and talk about something else next yep. time. I think that's important. It's been it's just been absolutely amazing. I've been looking forward to this show. Well, since since we, we talked about it really, well, um, because it's it, it I I hadn't I had no idea when I started this channel a year and a half ago that I'd be able to speak to the son of the author of a book that I was definitely part of my my um becoming who i who i am whatever i am and whatever it is i do part of it is due to your father's book it's incredible well well i mean it, trust me the pleasure is all been mine i mean because i i really like the stuff you do i mean you know being as interested in all this kind of thing as i am i've watched a lot of your shows and i think i think it's great and i it, you know i've had a lot of fun doing it um you know, I'd love to come back. I mean, we'll definitely do that. We'll book, then I'll talk about Peleliu or something. So I'll just remind sure. you what we're coming up next week and I'll come back and say goodbye to you in a second. So folks, okay. long weekend and Monday off for me. Nothing, nothing on Monday, but Tuesday, Australia in World War II week commences. Do take care of the times because with the time difference, they're mostly in the morning, although I've got two evening shows next week. Uh, one is an Australian who's getting up early. That will be um, Philip Bradley's coming on. He did the battle of the show about Shaggy Ridge last time. He's coming back on to talk about the landings in New Guinea. He's that's an evening show, and of course, I'm talking to John Buckley, the British historian, about his new book, Can You Defeat the Nazis? Which is a that a brilliant idea of taking those kind of books we had when we were kids in the 80s, where uh, you you made your own adventure books and you you said. It would say, like, if you want to go into the cave and try and defeat the dragon, turn to page 73 and you do that and you'd get killed or you wouldn't get killed. Well, he's done a book about where you take on the role of Churchill in 1940. You take on the role of various generals and, and politicians and you make decisions about the war and it tells you where to go. It's a brilliant book. I'm halfway through it. It's really amazing. So John Buckley is coming on next week to talk about that. But, yeah, Australia World War II week next week. Uh, as usual, don't forget to follow what we're doing on Twitter, share what we're doing on social media. Please consider becoming a patron because I want to keep on doing this full time throughout 2022 and beyond and beyond. So please consider five dollars a month. That would help me out enormously. But right now, it just remains for me to say thank you very much, Henry Sledge, for joining us. Um, people are saying that they definitely want you back. So let's just we'll we'll, we'll do that. We'll, we'll book that and we'll do that yeah. for next year. But it's been fantastic talking to you. Yeah, and absolutely. the insight you've given has been amazing. So thank you very much. I hope, well, if you enjoyed it as much as I did, we had a great fun. I, I hope it was well received. I have nothing to gauge it by. I hope it was. No, it's a, people loved it. And I, it'll, it'll do some traction over the week. And I think a lot of people will find it. So thank you very much. So Paul, folks, yep. this is Paul Woodhead for World War II TV saying, enjoy the week, your weekend. I will see you on Tuesday. And thank you for sticking with us. And thank you for some of the lovely things you've been saying in the sidebar today, both about Henry's appearance and about what I do in World War II TV. It's very gratifying that you care. So thank you very much. See you all after the weekend. This is Paul Dadge. Have a good weekend, everybody. Cheers.